Welcome to the program today. My name is Mona Gonzalez here with a question and answers session and I'm here with Karen. Hi everyone. It's always good to have Karen with us and we have a good time, fun. It's always awesome. Mm -hmm. I learn a lot every mm -hmm. time. It's been, uh, it's been great. We appreciate you guys sending in your questions to questions at prophecywatchers.com and it is our uh, goal to try to get to as many as possible. Certainly impossible to get to all of them but we appreciate you sending them in. Great questions and we got some good ones this time too. So what do we have? Yes. Starting off, we have a question from Mark who asks, I am perplexed about the words of Jesus in Luke, Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? I never realized that Jesus spoke specifically of the cross before his crucifixion. I know that he spoke of both his death and resurrection, but not that he spoke of the cross. Maybe this is a Greek translation issue. Would you please comment, clarify on, or instruct me in this matter? You know, this is um, not a Greek translation issue. Um, but it's interesting to me because I, I, back when I was a new believer, I had the same kind of thought. It was like, oh, well, Jesus was talking about the cross. But... We shouldn't be surprised by that because uh, no doubt Jesus, um, as he did ministry, there were thousands and thousands of people killed, crucified on, on a cross for sure. So this wouldn't have been anything um, unusual to see. But it's interesting the way that Jesus uses the phrase, the idea of the cross, um, in connection with following him, with, with being a disciple. And um, I don't really think there's any distinction between um, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a follower of Jesus. There, there isn't a, um, you're not a follower of Jesus or a disciple. You're one or the other. And Jesus uh, puts this standard out there pretty strong. And, but the imagery that he uses about the cross is, is interesting because a lot of people will wonder, well, what does Jesus mean to take up your cross daily? I mean, that's, that's a very um, theological uh, comment. And so I'd like to address that because we, we do see in the Gospels before the resurrection that the idea of the cross, Jesus saying, take up your cross or some form of that, appears six times um, really before the resurrection when he actually died. But there's a theology there. And so when you think about what he says there in Luke 9.23, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Uh, daily. That, that's when you try to put this into practice, that as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, which is what the word disciple means, and Jesus makes the comment, if anybody would come after me, and that was a very Jewish rabbinic phrase. Uh, you, you saw it often within the, uh, the Jewish writings of the day, or the, at least the tradition, where come after me, come after me, come, come, come and see. You see Jesus using that phraseology. And so it has the idea of this rabbinic figure who would take on disciples, who would want to be like him. And how, did, how, were you, how would you grow to be like the Messiah, or, or not the Messiah, but the rabbi? You would simply be around him. Mm -hmm. So when he would talk to this person, you would see how he was. When he, he would go over and you would see how he prayed, you would want to mimic him. Um, so that imagery uh, perpetuated itself all through rabbinic theology, this idea of, of a rabbi and his Talmudim, his disciples. So I want to read another passage here in Luke chapter 14 because... Jesus um, be speaks about if you want to be one of my disciples. Now, what's fascinating is because at the time, the, the Pharisees had disciples. You can look this up. It's in the Gospels. John the Baptist had disciples. They had, he had, they had followers. And Jesus came along as a rabbi, and he followed uh, that pattern, uh, which is very, very, it's a very neat pattern because in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, go in all the world and what? Make disciples. Mm -hmm. So we are called to go out and to, to get people to mimic us. Uh, hopefully we're worthy of being mimicked. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, to imitate me, for I imitate Christ. Certainly Jesus is the one that we all emulate. But we are to go out there and make disciples of, certainly of ourselves as well as we do it with Jesus. But what about the cross? It's, it's interesting. Um, in Luke 14, I'll read this. It says, if anyone comes to me, this is Jesus speaking, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So you think about that. He, if you don't hate your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, if you don't hate your own life, 
you cannot be a follower of Jesus. You cannot be one of his disciples. You cannot be one of his, his children in that regard. A lot of people get hung up on the theology here that certainly we know that Jesus doesn't want us hating our parents. I mean, that would violate the Ten Commandments that we're to honor them. But there's this idea of, um, this is a very well-known phrase. It appears in other rabbinic uh, contexts. And Jesus was a rabbi. What he was discussing here is this idea of comparison. That there is no, um, well, I like, I love God and I love this and I love this and they're all in one category. There's only one category if you're a follower of Jesus or a follower of God. And as it relates to a disciple, Jesus says, I want to be the one and only. Put me at the center of everything. If you're not willing to do that, you cannot be my disciple. Because um, and I'll just give you, he goes on in verse 27 of Luke 14. Whoever does not bear his own cross, there's that phrase again, and come after me cannot be my disciple. So the second time we have in Luke chapter 9 as well in Luke 14, this idea of taking up the cross. I'll talk about that in a second. Luke 14, 28 goes on, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Verse 33, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. So you have this extremely strict standard that Jesus puts out there at being one of his followers. And now, there's no doubt that um, any of us do this perfectly. That's not what Jesus is intending. He's talking about, is, where's your loyalty? Is your loyalty divided? Um, Jesus said that often, you can't serve God and mammon. The, he very much, especially going after the Old Testament concepts, that God says, you shall have no other gods before me. Uh, God wants loyalty. And so at the end of the day, um, you know, Mark's asking this question, what does it mean uh, about the cross? He did mention the cross, but as, as he, you can imagine, he's there with his disciples, and they're out walking, and there's the cross, and then they're looking at this cross, and they're like, wow, that's pretty serious death. And then Jesus says, well, if you don't take up your cross daily, you cannot be my disciple. Deny yourself and take up your cross daily. I imagine they were really confused because um, he had talked about his death and resurrection uh, several times, but associating it with his cross specifically, um, that wasn't revealed yet of how he was going to die. He did say, I'm gonna, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, he's going to be killed, he's going to be raised on the third day. But it wasn't necessarily um, revealed that it was going to happen through a cross. But let's go back and ask the question, what was the cross to Jesus? And we know from Hebrews chapter 12 that he endured uh, the shame and uh, he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. So he's looking at the cross. He didn't in, enjoy the cross. He endured the cross for the joy that was on the other side. But I'll read to you uh, Matthew chapter 26. This is when Jesus is in the garden. And it says, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Luke, this is Matthew 26, verse 37. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So here he is on the night he's going to be betrayed. He already knows that he has the cross. He's going to be on the cross within 24 hours. He's asking the father if this cross, if this cup could pass. So when we think about what was the cross to Jesus, ultimately it's really simple. The cross was not my will, but your will. Now if you take that imagery, that theological truth of what the cross was to Jesus, and you plug it in to this idea of being a disciple, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So Jesus is saying there in Luke 9.23, it, it entails denying yourself. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did in the garden. He denied his own human uh, feelings, his sorrow, um, his, his human desire, in a sense, to avoid the cross. Let this cup pass. But ultimately, he submitted to the will of the Father. He denied his own feelings at the moment, and he said, your will be done. Now, you think about that. Being a disciple and a follower of Jesus, 
Uh, how often is it that we go out and we're living life, could be in just living life, and uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil come against us to try to tempt us? And what are we confronted with? Are we going to sin? Are we going to do what we want? Or are we going to do what the Father wants? And so the, the theology is rich because anytime we come into a situation where a temptation comes, we have this question that God is going to say, Mondo, Karen, are you going to do your will? Or are you going to do my will? And we're like, oh man, this is so hard. And that's the essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That th these, these denials don't save us. We're saved by grace. We're saved by the blood of Jesus. We're saved by faith for sure. But part of what James 2 says is that faith without works is dead. And so a true genuine faith, Jesus makes the comment, will show itself as a disciple. It'll show itself out in works of repentance, fruits of repentance. John the Baptist said the same thing. So we know that um, in part of being a disciple is Jesus saying, hey, you need to take up your cross daily. And we go, oh man, I kind of wish you wouldn't have said daily. Yeah. But in reality, what we do know is that in part of our sanctification, as we grow in what it means to be a disciple, we have these opportunities where, again, put it yourself in a work environment, could be marriage, could be relationships, could be anything that where temptation comes. The question comes is, if you're my disciple, are you going to deny yourself? And are you going to say, okay, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. That's extremely hard. But Jesus very, said very clearly that he says it in a context too, that this isn't just about um, you know, post-salvation. He, he says, whoever would save his life, if you seek to save and do your own thing, you're going to lose your life. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. He has the idea here of, of salvation, that there are those that are false uh, professors. And Jesus says that in Matthew 7, 21. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. And Jesus says, get away from me. I never knew you. We know that there are those that have faith without works. Uh, even the demons have faith. Big deal. Uh, James says that in James 2, 19. But Jesus says in Luke 9, 25, what does it profit a person if he gains the whole world but loses or forfeits his soul? So you have the context of discipleship. So I, what I would tell Mark in this regard is that yeah, Jesus spoke about the cross, and it, it isn't, it isn't, um, it's now after we go after the resurrection, when all the Gospels are written down in a very nice, tidy form, that we begin to look and say, oh, I can see where Jesus was making this comment about uh, the cross. And it's a very powerful thing for all of us as, as we seek to uh, please the Lord in our, in our following. The word disciple, it means learner or follower in that regard. And so... Take up your cross. Well, daily. I was just sitting here thinking about that and how difficult it is for us to do that and how as Christians we aren't called to do that on our own anymore. It's something that the Holy Spirit is going to do through us and for us and with us. And I've realized over time and over learning that it's not something that we're called to do alone. And if we mm -hmm. try to do it alone, if we try to pick up a, our cross in our own strength, then it's not going to go well and it's not going to be pleasing to God because we're trying to please him on our own apart from him over here by ourselves. Let me perform for you. And that's not what he wanted at all. He wants that walk. He wants that relationship. He wants to walk around alongside us and help us. So I think that's so beautiful that God gives us that, that help with whatever it is that we're supposed to do he as Christians. He doesn't call us unless he equips us. And, Absolutely. And you see that in John 15, 5. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And this isn't about earning salvation, this, and not at all. That's then by grace, your faith. But mm -hmm. it is about demonstrating that the faith that we have is real, that, mm -hmm. that the faith that God has given us in Ephesians 2, it's a gift, is, is authentic. And it, that faith, I think what Jesus is after here, is he's not doing a works-based theology by any means, but what Jesus is doing is he saying, hey, again, I'm putting the standard out there. If you think you're a disciple, if you think you're a follower, but you're unwilling to put this attitude in front or this attitude to, to, to work it out, you're, 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 not, you're not my disciple. In Luke 9.62, very close to this, he says the same thing, that if you put your hand to the plow and you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. And so Jesus, in the Luke 14 passage, he puts it out there really as a, as a test to say, Count the cost. You know, if you're not willing to pay the cost, then don't sign up. Mm -hmm. Because it's, 
in a sense, yes, the gospel is free. There's no doubt it's a free gift. But the gospel also costs something. It costs our life. And that's why Jesus says, if you're, willing to, if you're not willing to lose your own life, your own desires, your own uh, selfish in, in ambition, your own intentions, what Jesus is saying there is, I want it all, and I don't accept anything less than all of it. Now, he doesn't, I'm so glad that he doesn't say, perfect yourself first. Yeah. We come to him when we get saved. We're saved by grace through faith. Uh, we're given the power of the Holy Spirit. We're sealed to the Holy Spirit. We're baptized in the Spirit by Jesus to walk a life that is fruitful and that bears fruits of the repentance that we've done and faith with works. And so and I think the cross is great yeah. image. And he gives us that new heart so that we change our desires and our motivations and what we want over time is, is gradually removed, not like something I have to give this to. He yes. changes it through his love and through our relationship with him. You know, it brings up another passage as you say that, because in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, it, uh, there it's describing it's this great Old Testament image of being washed by the water, um, also being given uh, a new nature, a new heart. God takes out the heart of flesh, which is unresponsive. He gives us a heart uh, flesh, which is soft. He also gives us his Holy Spirit, which again here is talking about the new covenant. But it says, I will give you my spirit and I will cause you to walk in my ways. God is the one motivating through the Holy Spirit inside of us. Um, that Galatians 5.16 says that if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we're, that's going to come up later as well. But Yeah, thank you. Little bunny trail there. Yep. Moving on, a question from Facebook. I do have a question. 1 John 5.16 tells us to pray for a brother in sin, but not for the sin unto death. What is that? Well, this, this is a, a question that comes up often, and it is a, um, it's a question that I wish John you know, in First John 5, would have written more about it. But I'll, I'll, read, uh, I'll read to you the whole context. This is First John 5, um, 16. And, and we know from verses 14 and 15 that he's talking about prayer there. If we ask anything according to the will of God, we have it. I mean, it's guaranteed according to the will of God. That's the qualifier. But then in First John 5, 16, he, he says this, If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. So uh, there's a lot of variations on what scholars will talk about what this means, but um, I'm going to skip all that, and I'm just going to give what I think is the most uh, comprehensive, consistent answer. Um, it's interesting here that um, we're, not, we're not Catholics in the sense that we have um, Catholic theology will have a mortal sin that removes you out of grace versus a venial sin, and they have these two categories. And, and that's why in verse 17 he says, look, all wrongdoing is sin. So sin is sin, but yet he's also making a distinction between those sins that will lead to death and those sins that don't. So in one sense, all sin leads to death, right? All, you know, we know Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. So there's a broad sense of the, where this is true, but in a very, let, let's, let's, that's the broad picture. Let's go into the, the trees now. We're looking at the forest now. Let's go to the trees. He's saying, hey, by the way, there's, there's these sins that, that happen that don't lead to death, and there's other sins that do. And so the question comes, um, honestly, is what's the death here? Is this eternal death? And I don't think so because I think it's, it's related to physical death. Now, in the Old Testament, in Leviticus 20, Numbers 18, um, you have these sins. You have some sins which were unintentional. You get forgiven. They don't lead to like the death penalty. And then you have other sins that were so serious that God said death penalty. That doesn't necessarily even mean that you lost your salvation back then. But it was physical death. And I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, in the book of Numbers, we know that, they, that the 12 spies had gone and they had um, spied out the land. They come back, they give a negative report. They're like, oh no, we're not going to make it, we're not going to make it. Why'd you do this, Moses? And then God's upset and he says, okay, that's it. Um, judgment on all of you. Um, you said you were going to die in the wilderness, you are going to die in the wilderness. Except anybody that's 20 and younger. I'm going to let your children grin. Everybody 20 and older, 
you're going to receive the, the punishment of physical death. And so they wandered in the, in the wilderness for those 40 years. And what happens? They all died. Now, that was a judgment of God. He, and they, they tried to go in and they tried to, oh, we're so sorry. And Moses says, you're going to fail. And they did fail. So God cast on them the judgment of physical death. Now, did um, uh, Aaron die? Yep. What about Miriam? Yep. There were several other people that were righteous believers that I expect to see in heaven one day. But they died. They were part of that judgment. They didn't lose their eternal salvation, but they were judged with physical death. Now, one of the reasons why I think here is I, I, I would say this proves that it's not eternal death, that he's speaking about physical death here, is because he says, if anybody sees his brother committing a sin or sinning a sin, not leading to death, specific kind of sin, he will ask and God will give him life. Well, he already has eternal life, so God can't give him eternal life again. Mm -hmm. So if he's, sinning, if he's sinning in such a way, sin has a destructive force to it. And if, if I see someone, a brother, who is a believer here, sinning a sin, I'm like, hey, this, is, this isn't good. This is, this is a, um, it's a sin, but it's not heinous. Um, then... I'm to pray for them and God will give them life. God will extend to them um, forgiveness, especially if they repent and get forgiveness, uh, confess. And so God will give them an extension of life, so to speak. Okay. But I'll give you an example here where um, James says this, my brothers, if, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of soons. So you have this consistency there where punishment, you have punishment of physical death. Well, let me give you a few New Testament examples. I just gave you some Old Testament examples where uh, people were killed if they sinned intentionally, death penalty, as well as the wilderness generation. But we all know in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira, here I believe they were believers. They lied to the Holy Spirit based on some property they had. God killed Ananias. And then the wife came in. She had an opportunity to be clean, come clean. She didn't. God killed her too. I'll read to you 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, which this is some consistency where you, here you have a believer, it seems, or one of the fellowship. He is having a relationship with his stepmother. He's bringing her to church. They're walking in, some, holding hands. I mean, they're, they're flaunting this. And the Corinthians were known for their um, tolerance of sin and look at us, look how loving and, and tolerant we are. It sounds a lot like many churches today. And Paul rebukes them and he says, you guys should mourn, have mourned over this. You shouldn't be rejoicing in your tolerance. But he says in 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And so what you have here is in one sense, Paul is using... Uh, phraseology that's typical of church discipline. And you see that in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 uh, through 18 as well. But he says, deliver him out. Get him out. Purge the leaven from you for, so that his, his flesh would be destroyed, but that his spirit would be saved. And so you have this idea of discipline. I'll read you another example in 1 Corinthians 11. It's in the same church that was in their tolerance. Paul says this, let a person examine himself when he's talking about taking the Lord's Supper. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we would judge ourselves, truly we would not be judged. So here Paul is saying, hey guys, Corinthians, you guys are totally taking advantage of the Lord's table. You're not sharing. And, and because of this, God has judged you. You've been chastised by the Lord. Some, God has caused some of you to be weak. He's caused some of you to be sick. And he's even caused some of you to die. So you have this, um, this uh, threat. God reserves the right to discipline his kids with physical death. We know that if you are a true follower of Jesus, you will never lose your eternal salvation. But we know from Hebrews chapter 12 that God disciplines his kids. And so in that same, uh, right before Hebrews 12, in Hebrews chapter 10, Paul, or not Paul, but uh, the writer there 
is describing the imagery, again, of, of not sinning willfully. And he says in Hebrews 10, 26, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. We saw that in the Old Testament. How much worse punishment then do you think will be deserved by those who have trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So the writer there is being pretty strong and saying, Hey guys, um, you don't want to sin deliberately um, because he talks about intentional and unintentional sins there. And you, so you have the same idea that at the end of the day, what John is writing and he's saying, if you see a brother that's sinning, but it's, it's a sin that isn't the sin unto death, you should ask, ask God for grace for that person. But he says, however, if he's sinning a sin that leads unto death, I don't think you should pray about that. And you think, well, that's kind of odd because, what do you mean? Um, are there times when we shouldn't pray for people? Well, I'll read you a passage here. It's not unprecedented. A um, couple things. We know from John 17, verse 9, Jesus says this. He's praying for the disciples. He says, I am praying for them to the Father. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. It's interesting here that Jesus doesn't pray for the world, that he only prays for the disciples. Um, and all through John 17, he's making a distinction between those whom the Father has given him, which are not of this world, and all the rest of, of the world that are unbelievers or whatever. Um, in Jeremiah 14, 11, it's just, it's this very unique passage where Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, he's praying for the people. Oh, Lord, pray, I pray that you would turn their hearts back. This is right before the Babylonian captivity. Finally, this is what God said, and it appears in Jeremiah 11, 14, 14, 11, and 7, 16. But I'll read you Jeremiah 14, 11. The Lord said to me, do not pray for the welfare of this people. Who would, have th who would think that? Yeah. Would, would God ever tell us not to pray for somebody? And most of our initial reaction would be, never. It's in the Bible. So God is upset here. He says, Jeremiah, do not pray for the welfare of this people. Though they fast, I will not hear their cry. And though they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. So you see, it, this is a consistent thing, but it is rare. I'm not saying that this is common. But you have the idea that, uh, especially in the Hebrews 10, God is going to judge his people. And so what John is writing is, hey, by the way, if you have, if you have a, a, someone that claims to be a believer and you see him, you see a brother, a believer sinning, but maybe they, you know, whatever, pick, pick a minor sin. You know, they, they, they said a, a, a minor cuss word and they can't get a hold of their language. Is that going to send them to hell? Of course not. Right. Okay. Is that even going to send them under the, the, the death penalty of physical death? Uh, oh, only God knows. Unfortunately, what John didn't do is tell us what kind are the sins that lead to death. He just says, by the way, there is a sin that leads to death, physical death, and there are other sins that don't. And you're like, John, could you at least explain that? Yeah. He left it ambiguous. And so I, I will we'll follow up. I'll, I'll finalize this with one other passage. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 Paul, again, is talking the contrast between the Holy Spirit walking in the flesh and walking in the Spirit. And he says this, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what I kind of fill in the gap is that Paul does list a group of sins here. He lists them also in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and Ephesians 5. 
where he says, I warned you guys about this, Galatians, that those who claim to be believers that are participating consistently in these kind of sins will not make it to heaven. Now, that's eternal life. But I think in the same way, uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, he lists similar sins. And then in verse 10, he says, but such were some of you. You've been sanctified, you've been forgiven, you've been washed by the Spirit. So there are those that profess to know God, but in their works they deny Him, Titus 1, 16. They're, they're dishonorable, they are worth nothing, is what Paul says there. But we have this list of sins here, which I think if someone claims to be a follower of Jesus, but they are consistently doing these, Paul says, they don't have eternal life. They're not going to inherit the kingdom. But what about believers who delve in some of these at times, you know, it, it doesn't define them. The key is that these kind of issues define this person. And Paul says, those who practice things will not go to heaven. Similar to Jesus in Matthew 7, 23, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. But believers can have fit of anger. They can be jealous. And we are constantly being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, and these things shouldn't define us. But I think when John writes, there are those believers that are committing sins that are not sins that lead into death, pray for them. There are others that are, sin, that are sinning sins that lead to death. And I would say that some of these are probably in that category. And it, I mean, if you see someone that is just getting wasted every single day, or they're partici- they claim to be a Christian, they're participating in orgies, um, John says, don't pray for them. Because th- they're going to receive... If they're a true believer, then God is going to give them physical death. And it's like in 1 Corinthians 5, deliver them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. Why? So that their spirit would be saved. We don't always know who's who. But, and, and it's not our job to go around and try to decide who's saved and who isn't. That's just that God doesn't call us to that. But he does call us to be fruit inspectors. And so, but the idea here, this is about intercession. He says, if you see somebody, pray for them. Ask for them. It's right for us to pray But if you see somebody really going over the top, um, John is consistent with with Jesus as well as Paul. Like, don't pray, just let them be. God's going to bring discipline. And we hope that they're believers and that discipline that comes will be swift. And what's the goal? To win them back. So that's that's kind of the long-winded answer. But it's a tough passage because it's so so ambiguous a little bit. So we kind of have to bring in some other pieces. Yeah. It's a very good answer. It's very thought-provoking, and um, I think it'll be challenging for a lot of Christians, like mm-hmm. just how they approach people. I think, too, even there, I mean, we have this idea of, of, of we, we should help others. I mean, our first reaction always should be compassion. As you mentioned, some people that maybe, again, like you think about somebody who's been a smoker for 30 years, mm-hmm. they become a Christian, and we go, "Why well, didn't you know that Christians aren't supposed to smoke, you know, or whatever? And they go, well, hey, man, you know, where's the grace and compassion? Now, again, we're not justifying anything, but something like that, you, you have compassion that it, it doesn't, it's not always turned around every day because we have a chemical dependency there. And I think for all of us, the, the attitude that John has is ask, ask on their behalf, pray for them, walk the journey with them, say, hey, look, part of being a Christian is being sanctified. It's, mm-hmm. it's growing in holiness daily, daily, not that we just turn it all off. You know, we do have a, you know, we, again, we should be willing to repent of our sins and put our faith and trust in Jesus for sure. And that's part of the characteristic, as we mentioned, of being a disciple. Yeah. So. Next question is from Michael, who asks, I would like to know what your thoughts are about a specific scripture in Matthew 8, 17, where Jesus quotes Isaiah 53, 4. It obviously was not the King James translation and was the one that best describes the truth of what had to be fulfilled. Obviously, griefs and sorrows have a certain amount of truth also. If this quote by Matthew is not from Isaiah, then where is it from? This is a great question. It's kind of a technical question, but I, we, we appreciate those for sure. And uh, I'll read to you Matthew 8:17, just so that we're all on the same page. Uh, Michael asks, and, and um, the verse is, uh, Jesus just got done healing um, a demoniac, you know, and uh, says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and he bore our diseases. Well, Isaiah quotes this, but then if you go back and read Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4, we've got to remember that in the New Testament, it's written in Greek, and we're looking at the Old Testament in Hebrew. And Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs 
and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. So if you compare that, in the New Testament Greek, it's illnesses and diseases, but yet in Isaiah 53, verse 4, at least in the English, it says griefs and sorrows. So he's wondering, hey, why the discrepancy? He was comparing the King James Version, uh, which is fine. But if you compare all the English versions, um, there's going to be a challenge there. And that's because we're dealing with language translation. Um, if you look in the Hebrew, um, uh, the Hebrew says it exactly as um, Matthew quotes it. So what Matthew's doing is he's quoting the Hebrew a little bit more literally in his Greek, because he's looking at the Hebrew version. Um, and so the Hebrew words certainly mean illnesses, and that the second word is the idea of pains, but it has the idea of pains with wounds. So there isn't a problem here. Um, one of the best translations, if you, ever, if, you, if, you, if you don't read the languages, that's fine. But one of the best translations I encourage you to make comparisons on is the Young's literal translation. I use it often just to get the sense of how uh, Young translated it because uh, he says this in Isaiah 53, verse 4, Surely our sicknesses, he doesn't use the word griefs, certainly our sicknesses he hath borne and our pains he hath carried them. So the word pains there is, I thought it's supposed to be diseases. And really, in fact, the word pains there is the idea of pains that comes from a wound. Um, I'll read you Jeremiah 51, verse 8, where it has the same Hebrew word, and how, this is how the net translates it. But suddenly Babylonia will fall and be destroyed. Cry out in the morning over it. Get medicine for her wounds. Um, most English translations will say pains, like a pain, but it is the idea of wounds. Uh, perhaps she can be healed. So get medicine for the wounds. And oftentimes we say, oh, my pains, my pains. And really what we mean is my, my cut or whatever. And so there is no discrepancy. I'm glad Michael asked this question. And so we have, um, when, when Matthew quotes this, he's quoting, uh, surprisingly, he's not quoting the Greek Septuagint version, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament. He's quoting the Hebrew, but he just, the words he chose are very reflective of a literal translation of Hebrew. I would say this too, that as it relates to the theology of this, I like the theology here because what Isaiah 53 is about is about the Messiah dying for the sins, making atonement for those uh, bearing the sins of others and carrying their, their illnesses and, and, their, and their pains or their wounds. By his stripes we are healed. The theology there is that Jesus, when he died on the cross, he paid for all of our healing. Done, paid for, so that um, if, if we, this, when Jesus healed somebody, Matthew was saying, hey, by the way, the reason that that guy got healed is because Jesus later died on the cross, and therefore that healing was paid for by Jesus on the cross, as Isaiah 53 said. So everybody, I'll say it this way, every single believer is entitled to healing. Okay, the question is the timing. We know that that healing doesn't always come in this life, but it is guaranteed to come. So that when, with the person that, you know, they maybe is blind or they can't see or they have other issues or they have other uh, maladies, they, on that day when they get a new body, they will get a new body that's free from all of the maladies that we have. And God says, hey, the reason I'm giving you a new body free from all disease is because my son paid for that on the cross, which comes back to Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. But the problem sometimes is today is we, we look at Matthew 8, 17 and we say, well, hey, Lord, it says here that um, part of the atonement is my healing. And God says, yeah. And you say, well, where's it? At? I've been waiting for 10 years or 20 years or whatever. And God says, I didn't promise you that healing would always come in this life. It will come. That is a promise based on the atonement. But it, it, sometimes we have to wait until the next life. And so we have the textual issue here, but we also have the rich theology that no matter what, um, no matter what malady we might have, we are going to be renewed on that day. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Something really exciting for a lot of people that we're looking forward to. Amen. Moving on to the last question, which is from Debbie. She asks, in Revelation 22, 1 through 3, we read about the river of the water of life and the tree of life, whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. I'm curious why those leaves would be necessary at that point when we are living in perfection. Your thoughts? 
You know, this is a great question, and I love sharing this answer because um, I think oftentimes we, as Christians, we're, we're um, followers of tradition, maybe an answer we've always heard or something we've always thought, something we were always raised. But this is a very intelligent question um, in the sense that in Revelation 21 and 22, we have um, the great white throne judgment is over. God creates a new heaven, new earth. This is what we would call the eternal mindset. Uh, All things have passed away, no more pain, no more sorrow. And then in chapter 22, we get introduced in a more in-depth way. Chapter 21 introduces the New Jerusalem. Chapter 22 gives us an expansion on it, gives us a little bit more details. I'll read to you chapter 22, verse 1, which is what she had referenced. I'll read 1 through 3 here. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. Great question. Well, why do we need the healing of the nations from the tree of life if there's nothing cursed anymore? Well, um, the idea sometimes is this idea of, think about the word immortality. Um, We think about immortality as something that immortal means it cannot die, okay? So we think, okay, in 1 Corinthians 15, I'll read to you this passage. Um, This is talking about the mystery that's going to happen at the rapture, uh, where we know in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 17, there are those that are dead or resurrected. But here he's talking about those that are alive. At the time, there's one generation, a full generation that gets to escape death. And that is the rapture generation. He says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised immortal or imperishable. It's the same Greek word. And we shall be changed. Now, here's the assumption is that When we get our new bodies, okay, the old body, corruptible, it's weak. Um, We could read the rest of 1 Corinthians 15 where the old body and the new body are compared. And uh, the new body is, is powerful, it's spiritual, it doesn't decay anymore. But what we assume is that when we get that new body, that this new body inherently will last and live forever. Now that's an assumption because what we do know, and and it's based on this idea that it will be raised immortal. But I want to read to you a couple other passages because um, Romans 1.22, I'm going to build this up on this term. What I did is I searched for the same Greek word, this idea of being immortal. Our new body is raised immortal or imperishable. Romans 1.22 says this, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. 1 Timothy 1.17 To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now here's the key passage. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. Hear these words. It's, Paul says, Which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has ever seen or can see. What God says here, what Paul says, or God says through Paul, God alone has immortality. The assumption is, is that God takes this immortality that he alone has, and grants it to those that are resurrected. I don't think that's the case. Now, we can have the fruit of immortality. What immortality means is um, God alone has immortality. He, He alone has the power of immortality in his own nature. Now, if something never dies, if God intervenes in somebody's life, and he never allows them to die, and he says, I promise... I know you don't have immortality on your own, but I promise I will never let you die. 
Well, that person has the, basically the result of immortality, even though he might not have immortality in his own nature. Because immortality simply means no death. But the Bible says that God alone has that capacity or that nature or that characteristic. Mankind does not. But the new body that we is raised to immortality, another way to say it is imperishable, but in another way it's that new body that we have will not die. That doesn't mean that it has the power of no death in itself, but God says that new body that I've given you will last forever and I won't allow it to die. Why or how? Well, I'm going to read to you Genesis 3.22, which I think solves the riddle here. Because we know in Revelation 22 that the tree of life is there for the healing of the nations. So the tree of life is given, that the leaves are there in order to perpetuate healing. Okay? And well, in Genesis 3.22, after Adam and Eve had sinned, they were cast out. They were now became sin, they had the sin nature. And it says this, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowledge, good and evil, in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach, a, reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned everywhere, every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Let me re re restate that in verse 22. Lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. What he's saying there is that mankind was given the sentence of death. Sin entered their body. They were corrupted, we know. But they, God says here that they could have lived forever. How? By eating of the tree of life. And so what the tree of life did is, is, even in the beginning when God made Adam and Eve, there was no sin, there was no death. So God said, hey, the wages of sin is death. So if they would have never sinned, it's not that they would have never necessarily decayed or died necessarily, but God says, I'm going to prevent you from ever dying by giving you access to the tree of life. So the end result is the same, even though, again, God alone has immortality. So when he made Adam and Eve, it wasn't that he, in, even before the sin, before sin came into the world, it wasn't that they uh, naturally had immortality. It was that God gave them access to the tree of life, which would perpetuate their life, which is no death. Okay. So when we see the tree of life appearing again in Revelation 22, we do have new bodies. I would say that our bodies are powerful. They're similar probably to, similar maybe even better, I don't know, than the bodies of Adam and Eve prior to, to when they sinned. But the fact that God gives us access to the tree of life guarantees that we will never die. Mm. And so the new bodies that we get are holy, they're righteous, and so there'll, there'll be no more opportunity for uh, sin or disruption. And so in the same way, um, I find this, this little hint in Genesis 3.22, the tree of life appears, even in their sinful state, they would have lived forever. So in the same way that we need and we will be given access, that's the promise we see in Revelation 2, Jesus says, for those that overcome, I'll give them the right to eat of the tree of life in the paradise in the garden of God. And so when we see the tree of life appearing at the end, it's not that, again, death is reigning, but why isn't death reigning? Death isn't reigning because we have access to the tree of life again. And so the tree of life is given. All people get access to it in Revelation 22. We eat of it. The leaves are there to keep us living forever. Mm. And so you have the, the full circle of the purpose of the tree of life, which makes great sense that it's not that, um, again, even in our new bodies, we will still be eating. We will still need nutrition. But by getting access to the tree of life, it will no longer be forbidden for us. And even then, so you, if you compare them, Adam and Eve in their sinful state could have lived forever, but that would have been horrible. You think about even the aging process at the time, um, but in the new, with, even with our new bodies, the access is what guarantees paradise. Isn't that beautiful of God to give us the bookends from in the Genesis and in the Revelation picture? He has that tree of life that he refers to and how he keeps us from getting it when it will be harmful to us, but yes. he provides it to us freely and liberally when we need it, when it's appropriate. Yep. I love that. Yep. And you know, at the end of the day, I mean, uh, God's 
God's gracious, mm -hmm. and God spared mankind from living in a state of uh, really death and, and really of, of, of decay and, and, and um, less than perfection after they had sinned. And so we, we have the, we, we're again, once again reminded, and as you mentioned, the bookends of what God has done for us. And that's why I enjoy the questions. We really appreciate you guys continuing to send them in. And uh, it's been good. Yeah. Thanks, Karen, for being here. I always love hearing your answers to all yeah. these great questions. I appreciate it, guys. And so please send in your questions, questions at prophecywatchers.com, and we will continue to, uh, Karen and I have a great time. We'll continue to come back and share them with you. So we will see you next time.